Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to the webinar of today. Uh, the speaker of today is uh, Joachim Panke, and um, uh, he will talk about extreme events, entropies, and instantons for turbulence and water waves. So as usual, I introduce the speaker very briefly, and then I leave him the floor. So uh, Joachim Panke, uh, born in uh, uh, 1956, graduated at the physics department of the University of Tübingen and received his PhD in 1988 on nonlinearities and chaos in the uh, transport of electrons and semiconductors, and uh, he got his habilitation in 1992. In 1990, he became a researcher uh, of the CRTB, uh, today NIL, uh, of the CNRS in Grenoble in France. And in 1994, he moved to the physics department of the University uh, of uh, Bayreuth in uh, Germany. From uh, 1993 to 19, uh, uh, until 1998, he has been an Eisenberg Fellow of the Deutschen Forschungsgemeinschaft. In uh, 1998, he became professor of the experimental physics, focusing on uh, wind energy, turbulence, and stochastic processes of the Department of Physics of the University of Oldenburg in uh, uh, Germany. So uh, it's uh, with uh, great pleasure that I uh, introduced uh, Joachim uh, Panke for the webinar of today. So I stopped sharing my screen, and Joachim, you can start sharing yours. I have to switch on my micro first. Thank you yes. very much for the introduction. And I'm pleased to present you today something on the topic of extreme events, entropy, instant, instant tones for turbulence and water waves. First of all, I congratulate you. I think you make a very fantastic job with this series of webinars with uh, with uh, presentations each week on the topic of turbulence. Yeah. And it's for me also an honor to contribute today to this sequence, but I think it is really, I appreciate a lot, your effort, efforts you are doing, bringing the community a little bit together. Okay, so far. Now, today I will, as a title is announced, present this. The title sounds perhaps very uh, abstract and theoretical. I just want to state right at the, at the beginning that I am in principle experimentalist and try to work phenomenological and on turbulence. So do not hesitate to ask me or to interrupt me and to explain it a, a bit more in a vivid way. I try my best to include some examples to make it vivid. I must say it also at the beginning that the work I present here, a good part, the main part was done by Andre Fuchs in his PhD and Tom Wester and Matthias Wächter. Okay, let's start. Now let's see how it works. Now it doesn't work. Why I do not... You see my screen? Yes. No, uh, no it works. Uh, yeah. Okay, it doesn't go with left, right. It just goes with end up. Okay, first I start the motivation of my turbulence research over the energy topic. I think everybody of you is aware of the actual energy topic. I am with my turbulence research mainly involved in wind energy research. There's the main finance coming from. And it turned out if you look closer, wind turbines are operating. At places where you have high wind, naturally you want to make power out of it. And wind turbines are still, if they reach heights of 200 meter, they are small, they are still in the boundary layer and they face mainly turbulent working conditions. So the turbulence is the main feature of the energy resource of wind energy. And to understand the, the working principle of the wind turbine, it is necessary to understand the turbulence, the working condition. And there, one remarkable feature of turbulence is this small scale feature of turbulence, these increment statistics, which become on smallest scale, very heavy tailed, very intermittent, very non-Gaussian. 
and it is measured by the velocity difference. You can take it in space or time if you take the Taylor hypothesis of frozen turbulence. So if you have changes of wind speed in four seconds, this would be a velocity increment of about distance 40 meter or so on. And if you look at the statistics I show over here, you see in the blue curve, very high probability of big events in particular, if you compare these with the Gaussian statistics shown in red. So you measure each few days a wind speed change if it's a windy day. Here is a measurement from the coastline close to Oldenburg. You measure wind speed changes of 10 meter per second, about 40 kilometer per hour, the change of the wind ramping up or ramping down in a few seconds. And this definitely gives a lot of bending moments on the turbine, loads on the turbine. And there's a uh, very important feature of the new modern wind turbines. They are made out of uh, composite material. And the composite material, the fatigue of the composite material goes with the bending, with the extension, how it is, uh, the position is changed. And these changes or bending, the higher the amplitude is, the higher the load is. And the load goes with this amplitude to power eight. So this is telling you that a few big bending will cause much more load than all the small bending, the small shaking of a wind turbine on, on a long time. And that's why for the material fatigue, it is very essential to understand the extreme events. And therefore, this is still a challenging question. And there are a lot of understanding is missing. We have phenomenological uh, uh, rule of thumbs, but a proper statistical approach to it is still missing. Okay, but the proper statistics as the spending is coming from turbulent conditions is somehow based in the understanding of turbulence. But I was got recently aware, it is uh, a story which is much longer. It is also for the science of fusion. If you take, for example, the tokamak type of fusion, the main problem in getting these fusion reactors working is the turbulent problem, the turbulence of the plasma, the extreme events, how it's become instable and so on. And therefore, it is for me a little bit the claim that for our energy issues, I could go on with further examples, stability of the grid, if you have fluctuation power input and so on and so on. But all everywhere there, you see in, in a lot of aspects, the fingerprint of turbulence, and that's why a profound understanding of turbulence is important. And this is the topic of my talk today. So how do we approach turbulence? We know we all believe, I still believe in the Navier-Stokes equation, that Navier-Stokes equation is describing our turbulence problem. And we take here the, the incompressible case because still also for wind energy, the wind speeds are below speed of sound. So there are two different approaches. You can see one more from the engineering side. If you want to see how to calculate, usually you, you use one simulation, large eddy simulation, and so on. Another approach is, which is discussed a lot uh, in the context of homogeneous isotropic turbulence, is a statistical approach. Now, the one's approach there, the idea is from the turbulent field, you only want to know the mean field and the big structures. You, you do not care about the small noise. You want to, you want to see these structures building up and on the structures, uh, you, you, you try to develop an understanding of the turbulent flow. Whereas the small scale noise, which is added, which is also contributed a part of the turbulence. This is typically described by statistical methods. 
And this is a statistical approach where we look at the statistics of fluctuations, which we characterize by velocity increments shown over here and uh, to the right. And then the statistics, whether you take the moments, the Fourier transform or whatever, or the probabilities of these velocity increments, velocity fluctuation on different scales, uh, it depends which way you like to work. And there the prominent case is if you come to smaller and smaller and smaller scales, there you see awkward statistics, non-Gaussian statistics, big events, extreme events, intermittency, and so on. And this understand, and therefore to have an understanding is still a challenge. Okay. Today, I want to present you an approach, an aim we are approaching to unify somehow both sides, on one side grasping structures, on the other side getting a statistical description. And I claim in principle, if we get a statistical approach a little bit further, if we look at velocity increments, we always take the velocity at two points, x and x plus r. But if we have a structure, a structure is typically characterized by many points in a sequence. So I claim is if we would have a joint multipoint statistics that we know at several points in the flow, what the probability it is of having a sequence of velocities, if we have such a multipoint statistical description, then we should get both aspects together, the statistical approach and the structural approach. Okay, you can take a different introduction, how to approach turbulence. Let's look at the once equation. You know the once equation, you first want to know the mean flow, but you have the closure problem. If you want to know the mean flow, you need to know the Reynolds stress. The Reynolds stress you can describe by the Navier-Stokes equation. You need higher order correlations of the velocity. For example, a triple correlation, not ui, uj, but ui, uj, u alpha, always prime, the fluctuation. And if you close to this, you, see, you know the second order depends on the third order, the third on the fourth order, and so on. This is called the closure problem. But there's another term. If you try to explain the Reynolds stress, the second term is the pressure, pressure velocity correlation. And the pressure velocity correlation, usually there's not much closure on it, but the pressure velocity correlation, this will get, lead you to explain it because the pressure is non-local. Therefore, you can take the solution of the pressure by a Green's function. Therefore, then you need the velocity at the position x dash and another position x. So the pressure will say that you need to know not the statistics at one point in ever different directions, but at several points. And if you try to explain, to, to describe this velocity pressure correlation by the Navier-Stokes equation, you will see the same closure. The two point depends on the three point, the three point on the four point, and so on. And here you end up also, if you want to make a proper closure, you should know the multipoint statistics. Okay. So far, introduction, I try to motivate that we need more statistical knowledge about or description about turbulence than only one point or two point statistics. As already mentioned, the, the classical approach, the classical turbulence discussion, Kolmogorov and all following up, uh, fractal, multifractal model, and so on, they mainly stick to the dis uh, discussion of statistics of velocity increments. These are two point quantities. Uh, end point would be that we have several points picked at the same time and see how the velocity at one point and the other and the other, other and the probability of this can be described. 
Now, if I say endpoints, you can imagine, oh, this problem gets difficult. Yeah? If, you, if I say 10 and you say, no, I want to know 100 or 1,000 or what is sufficient point. So how can we approach these joint multipoint statistics? So, so far you should agree that from what I said is for the closure problem and for the description of structures and forms of turbulence, it is important to have somehow approach these multipoint statistics, the joint multipoint statistics. Okay. Now, I take here some data set from a measurement and I try to visualize the problem of multipoint statistics. I just take a sequence of points x0 to xn and at these values, I want to know the statistics. And then I take ensemble average. I take this snapshot, the next snapshot, the next snapshot. And with this, I can try to estimate the joint multipoint statistics. But you can see very fast to, to estimate such a multipoint statistics, if you make a binning for each value of 10 uh, different values, you end up very fast in a huge matrix where you need enormous number of data. It is nearly not feasible. I want to reformulate the same problems by the tool or by the, 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 the quantity of an increment. Instead of having these endpoints, I say these endpoint statistics, these joint endpoint statistics, I can also describe by a joint n minus one increment statistics. So I only know the velocity difference between two points and the next two points and the next two points and so on. And I take a reference point. I think it should be obvious this has the same information. It is somehow trivial, but it has a nice feature because with a sudden, I express my joint endpoint statistics by a sequence for increments, which are really localized one set in, inserted in the other one. They are ni nicely joined, but they have such a sequence. And here I have with a sudden our cascade from large increment to smaller increment, smaller or as large space R0 to R1, R2, R2, R3, and getting smaller and smaller and smaller in the distance, which is somehow zooming in, in the turbulence. And this is a common, common point what, what we are very often discussing. This is the cascade. So the cascade in the increment, I have now here combined with the joint endpoint statistics. This is mathematically so far correct, nothing changed and nothing got more simple. But now the question it is, can we simplify this joint multi-point or joint multi-scale, multi-increment statistics? Can we simplify it? And first, we can express everything by conditional probabilities. This is all the mathematics. If I have a joint probability A, B, I can express it by A conditioned on B times the probability of P. So this is mathematics you can work through. So I can all, everything express in joint, uh, uh, in multi-scale uh, uh, conditioned probabilities. But what I've shown here, so I pick one increment and condition it on, on the other one. I pick the next one and condition it on the next one and, and so on. I just see that I have here typing error because I, in what I will do, I will do it in the sense of the cascade I take a small increment and condition it on a larger, 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 larger one. And then I take the next one and the larger one. I wrote it here in a different way. I take the biggest one and condition it on the smaller one, the next one on the next small one. Mathematically, everything is the same. You can do this formalism, upwards cascade, downwards cascade. Mathematically, it's everything's the same, what I'm telling. 
but I will stick here for the downwards cascade that I look on a smaller increment and look how it's conditioned on the larger one. And instead of simplifying now these joint probabilities, I ask, can I say join, uh, simplify the multi condition probabilities? And if I take one, I look at the probability whether it's depend on the next larger one, next larger one, next larger one. But this I can do numerically, and there is a amazing result that you find if you pick one increment, it only depends on the next larger one. The other one, it is independent. This is shown here in the contemplates of two uh, velocity uh, statist increment statistics. Once I conditioned, uh, I, I pick one increment and I conditioned on a larger one. These are the black contours. And the red contours is I condition it on two larger ones. And you see both are nearly identical, statistically perfect. So this means that the statistics of one increment is only depending on the next larger one and not, not further. If you think over, this indicates a three-point closure of these multi-conditioned probabilities. And in this way, now I can simplify the whole cascade by just looking at one step, how one is going to the next one and then the next one to the next one. And uh, yeah, and as I said, these condition probabilities yeah, now have a meaning of this three point closure has a meaning of a Markov process. Mathematically, it is telling you that you only need to understand one step processes. And this is a Markov process. If we now consider this cascade process from a large increment to a smaller one, to a smaller one, to a smaller one, as a stochastic process. I take the increments, I fix one point to the right, and now I change my distance, let it go smaller and smaller and smaller. And then I have, I say something like a cascade path, a sequence of increments as you come from large scale to small scales. And for this sequence, this I consider as a stochastic process. I know something and want to know what is the next, in the next step, my, my next increment as I go down the cascade. And this process, as I have shown this, uh, uh, independence of double condition probabilities, this three point closure, this is mathematically telling you nothing else that this is a Markov process. And this opens up a new door. If you get this interpretation, you step with this result, how you can simplify the multi condition PDFs, you can step into stochastic processes. And these are Markov processes. And then you know how to. You can read it up. You go to the mathematics and ask someone, what, how can I describe a Markov process? And then there are several conditions under which a Markov process can be described by a Fokker-Planck equation. So you get a partial differential equation, which explains you how these probabilities from large to small, how these are changing with the scale. And this is if you change your scale, and that's why to the left of the Fokker-Planck equation, we write minus R minus DDR. So we go from large scale to smaller scales. We, we, we look in the direction of going to smaller scales. And the main feature of this stochastic processes is that you get a partial differential equation for it. And there are two terms, a drift term, which is telling you a little bit deterministically how you come from large to smaller increment. And we know it, if we look at increments, if we have a large distance, the fluctuation may be larger. If we are on smaller distance, typically the, 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 uh, the fluctuation becomes smaller. So in the mean tenden tendency, you see that the increments get smaller and smaller, yet the smaller your scale will go. After Kolmogorov 41, you expect this growth of R to one third. This is more or less in D1. This is a drift term, the deterministic evolution. But in a stochastic process, you have fluctuation around, and how big it is fluctuating, this is called the diffusion term D2. 
And now, now it's a very nice feature that this diffusion, drift and diffusion coefficient, if you have data, this you can measure from your data. And therefore you need only the probabilities how a bigger increment goes over to a smaller one. If you can estimate these probabilities, this I have shown you already here to the right, if you can estimate these probabilities for different R continuously changing, then you can measure this drift and diffusion equation telling us you measure the Fokker Planck equation or you measure the equation for the Markov process. And this is amazing that can be done. And it is amazing that we do not do this since, since the beginning because it was 1931 that Kolmogorov wrote this, all this down. In mathematics, the Fokker Planck equation are called Kolmogorov equations. And he wrote down also how you can estimate mathematically these uh, coefficients, these functions, these drift and diff diffusion coefficient. But definitely he didn't has not computer, he has not million data where you can do it numerically. This perhaps nobody uh, realized before. But then you can do it. And down here, you see the, the result of the measurement of D1 is more or less a linear function with UR. And I get a diffusion D2 and I can show higher order D3, D4 is nearly zero, which is telling you that this approach of a Fokker-Planck equation is good. And this is a nice part, yeah, you have some data. From the data, you determine the condition probabilities, increment statistics. Yeah? At the beginning, you have data endpoint, and then you go to the increment space and look how they are set into each other. And if you have this, you determine from this condition probability afterwards also your stochastic equation, Fokker-Planck equation. And this is just number crunching you can do. And if you have now the Fokker-Planck equation, or you can call it also, if you take a single trajectory, not in the probabilistic space, but if you want to see how one increment is changing, you can formulate accordingly a Langevin equation for those who are familiar with stochastic processes, I work here with the E2 picture. But this is all mathematically very nicely worked out. Okay, and then I can go back. I have the stochastic description and with this de stochastic description, I have the joint multipoint statistics and then I can generate new data. This I will show in the following. But you can, it is nowadays more modern. You can say, finally, this is nothing else than machine learning. Yeah? You make a machine learning of a stochastic equation. You take your data, number crunching, and you learn it. And if anybody of you is interested, we have an open source uh, software package. If you have some data, whether it is turbulence data, whether you have weather data, or you have other complex data, you can just plug it in and do the whole analysis in this way. So there you get also, you, you put in your data and you get afterwards your Fokker-Planck equation. But well, what to do with it? We have now a stochastic description of the cascade. We have a Fokker-Planck equation, which describes us these probabilities of how one increment is changing to the next one, a larger increment or increment on a larger distance, how it's going over to an increment on a smaller distance. What can we do with this description? And where, if you have such Fokker-Planck equation, you have two major possibilities. You have a stochastic equation of the system. You have it very well described. With this statistical description, you can go in non-equilibrium thermodynamics, statistical physics. You can work, you have your equation, and then you can make some application or uh, statistical analysis, or the other way, you can use it for applications. And I will go now in the next, how long do I still have here? Yeah, in the next half hour, 20 minutes, I will go through some applications. Okay, statistical physics, it is 
non-equilibrium system because if you look closer at the Fokker-Planck equation, you see how the, if you go down the cascade from fluctuation on large scale to smaller scale to smaller scale to smaller scale, the process, the drift and diffusion coefficient which describe this evolution equation, they change on, they depend on R. They change with the R scale. So they are not constant, but always running away. They are instationary. This is an instationary stochastic process. And that's why we are in non-equilibrium. It is always running away. And there has been in the last 20 years, quite, quite nice uh, new results, theorems on, on non-equilibrium thermodynamics, in particular also running to entropy, where rigorous entropy laws are found. Okay, no, I jump, sorry. <laughs> There's been a little bit, the sequence has been, I don't know why it changed. What I just showed is application. Now I'm here in non equilibrium thermodynamics. I go to entropy. The nice point is with this, you can go into an entropy concept. So the first point is uh, we have, again, this cascade. We have these trajectories, how an increment of, from large scale, if you reduce the distance between the points and you, you look at the increment, how it is changing with R. For this one, we have the Fokker-Planck equation. And if you have the Fokker-Planck equation, you can determine with the Fokker-Planck equation an entropy. And the entropy has, has two contributions a medium entropy and inner energy entropy. But anyway, the main point is to determine this entropy, you need your measurement UR on different scales, and you need the knowledge of the Fokker-Planck equation, this drift and diffusion term. If you have both, you can determine for each cascade event one entropy value. So we have such a path locally here. And for this path, for this blue part of your, of your time series, ending at the smallest increment, we get an entropy. And we can say whether we have a positive entropy or negative entropy, the entropy production for this smallest increment where we end the whole path uh, can be determined. And here I have shown you the result. The black curve is the velocity increment on large scale. The blue curve is the velocity increment on the smallest scale. I took here the Taylor lengths. So this is the starting point and the end point of the trajectory of our cascade. And for each such cascade, I get an entropy value. And this is shown here in red. And we see the fluctuation of the entropy sometimes it is positive, and here I, I marked the one where you see also a negative event. And you, if you look very close to this negative event, you see the negative entropy coincides in blue with a velocity increment which gets very big. So on small scale, I have a big increment, and then typically I have negative entropy. Well, if, if I take positive entropies, I often have small increments on small scales, what we expect naturally. So this is, if you have on small scale and big increment, this is a big deviation from what you expect in average. But the main point is we can determine mathematically in the data, and this we have also in the software program, you, if you have data, you get out for each event, your entropy calculation. Now, we have an entropy for each cascade event we can get out of our data. And then it is important, so what, this is mathematically, but it's important we see the fluctuation of the entropy. We could, can look at the statistics of the entropy. Overall, the entropy is positive. The mean value is 0.4, so it is, it's okay. 
but we have these tales of the entropy and there is an important lemma that the entropy the integral of the entropy e to minus delta entropy the mean value this should be rigorously one so in equilibrium thermodynamics we know entropy should grow if i leave my system independent for non-equilibrium systems if it is discrepant this is a necessary condition no it's not sufficient condition there if it's if it's if it's described by the Fokker Planck equation, then this integral fluctuation theorem should hold. So what is the integral fluctuation theorem? I have the probability of my entropy fluctuations shown to the right over here. And I multiply this by e to minus delta x. So this is an exponential function, which is decaying. Yeah? So for the negative, it is very large. For positive, it becomes very small. So you give a big weight on the negative entropy events, and you have to sum it up with a lot of, of, of positive entropy events. So if entropy would be zero, a fixed point, then it's clear you get one. So this somehow, um, this result gives you a condition on your probability. It's somehow give you a balance between negative entropy events and positive entropy events. So the, the distribution, how often you get negative and how often you get positive events is somehow fixed by this integral fluctuation theorem by the condition that it must be one. And the amazing point is we can do the analysis and look at these mean values. And here to the left, if we take 100 increment, uh, uh, no, 100 entropy, 100 cascades from our data and determine the entropy and this e to minus entropy averaged after 100, after 1000, it converges to one. And after 10,000 such cascades or entropy values, we come very closely to the result one. And we were even looked for a stochastic process to find it and we tried to get the best value and we got an entropy integral this integral fluctuation theorem that it is fulfilled exactly to to one to 0 0.997 and you see if you have more and more data it is really nicely statistically converging the difference from one gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and this is for me, I'm doing uh, 30 years turbulence research. This is for me one of the most amazing results. I never got a precision result. Such a precision result, it is really for me a wonder that we got it. It is really a high precision. Tell me something, some other features of turbulence where you get it, it must be hold to per mil and better. And no, it is not a trivial result, yeah? It is really fixing the entropy distribution of negative and positive uh, entropy events. And all this is based on, as I've shown here, the definition on a knowledge of a Fokker-Planck e equation describing our data and you put in the real data. So you take your measurement data, you take your stochastic model, and if both are correct, then you get the result. And it's very sensitive. We tried a little bit with fitting and so on to D1 and D2, our coefficients. And if we fit a little bit bad, you are kicked off very fast, very fast. You see really details which must be fulfilled by the stochastic process to get this exact result of this integral fluctuation theory. Yes, for me, it is, it is it's perhaps I would like to, 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 to propose it as a conservation law, which must rigorously fulfill for turbulence. And we tried it here with 60 different experimental data. We took turbulence from fit, cylinder, jet, and so on. 
some others, Biocal, used also this uh, uh, algorithm and, uh, and, and looked at inhomogeneous and uh, not homogeneous isotropic turbulence where you have a shear insight and so on. And also there, you see the whole framework works. You can describe the fluctuation, the multipoint statistics with Fokker Planck and obtain this rigorous result. Okay, now there are further developments, more modern uh, uh, results from non equilibrium thermodynamics that you can, if you have the Fokker Planck equation, you can go also in the direction of instant tones. You can define an action, which is again, I go here fast through it. If somebody is interested, we can go more in details. The main message I want to give, you must know the Fokker-Planck equation, which we estimate from the data, which we measure from the data, and you must have your US, your velocity increments of your data. You must have real data and an estimated Fokker-Planck equation. And then you can define an action, and if you have an action, you, you can say variational principle, maximum principle, and then it is straightforward. You can derive a Hamiltonian, and for the Hamiltonian, you get some, some mean passes, which are called afterwards uh, instant tones. And here I, I show these instant tones. It is finally, and we extended this instant tone conditioned on the entropy, the evolution that you say, I fix the entropy and then I want to see my instant tones. I can look at all our trajectories from large increment, from large scale to small scale of the increments. These are the white curves shown here, the noisy curves going down. And then for this initial condition, entropy, I can determine uh, from the Hamilton function, function a most likely path where the system should go. And these are the red curves going down. I hope you see them. The color is shown for all, we, we take a lot of data and take the probability if you start at the large increment with negative entropy, how the trajectory is going down. This you see, and this is the probability. And in principle, this instant tone should be somehow the maximum of the probability. We have small deviation, but this we know where it's coming from. But this is for positive increment. Above, we start at large scale, large scale increment. And we go down to smaller and smaller scales. And then look in the middle, you have zero. Then we end up in small increments. And if this is going with R to one third, it will be called Mogorov 41. This is what we expect. If we now look at negative entropies, we see the inverse. We start in the mean at the large scale on a small fluctuation. But as we go down the cascade, we see big fluctuation. So the smallest increment has the biggest fluctuation for these negative entropy trajectories. And if you look rigorously at uh, make an analysis of the Fokker Planck uh, of the Hamiltonian, it shows there is a strictly forbidden region for negative entropy values. It is forbidden that your increment from large scale ends at a small increment at smaller scales. The zero region, which I showed here in red circle, this region is rigorously forbidden. You can make a bifurcation analysis of the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is forbidden to go over there. These main trajectories, these instant tones or entropones, how we call it, the instant tones for this entropy are not allowed, never come to zero. Whereas the other one approach zero, if you would say the cascade is longer, they will come to zero. So this is a remarkable feature, which is finally telling you that the, and, and, and as I said, the integral fluctuation theorem will, for, if you have positive entropy, will force you that you must have a special number of negative entropy events. Otherwise, the whole concept does not work. So this is a rigorous consequence of the integral fluctuation theory. And if we go further into statistics and look for our small scale velocity increment distribution, which is typically intermittent shown to the left. And if we look the contribution 
of these negative entropy values, we see the negative entropy values will make the wings, the intermittent wings of our uh, velocity increment distribution. So from this, we can conclude intermittency is a consequence of negative entropy effects. Okay. This work is, is, was really done uh, in, in, in a very important uh, cooperation with the group of Boucher, Roland, and Herbert, where we cooperated. And they taught us how to use this instanton uh, 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 procedure. And together we combined it with our turbulent data and our Fokker Planck equation. And so we got these nice results. Okay, so I gave you a few a little bit insight what non-equilibrium physics you can do. You can do much more if you if your statistical physics with the Fokker Planck equation knowledge, this opens you the door for doing a lot of different things. But now I want to come to another aspect, more applied aspect. What can we do with it? We can apply it, we, I, I showed you can apply it to different uh, data sets. You can, the claim is we have a quite comprehensive description of a complex system. Remember, in terms of joint multipoint statistics, we have such a description. And this we can use also for Eulerian turbulence, what we did. So the whole story I showed you just for one point measurement, we did it also for PIV. This is a PIV measurement of a turbulent flow behind the fractal grid where you have also shears. It is not homogeneous, it's a near field, not homogeneous isotropic, but there you can apply it. And then you can determine to the left, you have the velocity field, the magnitude by PIV measurement, and to the right, we have the entropy structures. And you, you really see some structures. This is just starting points where we want to go on and show how these structures are, uh, the entropy structures are connected to flow structures. We, but we get here, you see visually first signs where you have the big gradients and so on. These are the region where you have uh, Negative entropy. So here in black is always shown the negative entropy uh, cases. And you see from these two flow examples, one is more structured than the other. This we see also in the entropy structures. We can apply the same to Lagrangian turbulence, particles flowing in, in, a, in a turbulent flow. And here, if you look, here's a question of these big events, this big acceleration you expect yeah, for, for particles. This is a question, where is this coming from? And there you can do also the analysis multi-time, joint multi-time points and make the same analysis. And you can define, if you have n time point statistics, you can make the increments all the star story in the same way. And you see, you can define the Fokker Planck equation, you get your uh, entropies. And then we see these positive entropy events is if you look at this time cascade, you see also the, the, this, the fluctuation on smaller and smaller time scale gets smaller and smaller. But if we have negative entropy events, they pile up which is finally what you see here, this big loop or this big acceleration increment of a velocity over in time over tau is the acceleration. So if I have a big acceleration, I must have a big temporal increment. And these big acceleration we see are related to negative entropy values. And again, you have this connection with the integral fluctuation theory. So both structures, these acceleration peaks and these noisy acceleration, they are all combined in one statistics, which must have a common integral fluctuation theory. This is shown here. The integral fluctuation theory is fulfilled. And we have another result, phenomenological, where I get some problems with the theoretician. If I look at a detailed fluctuation, which is more than the integral, it's not the integral, but the detailed fluctuation, say the probability 
from one entropy with positive value and the same one with a negative value, plus delta s total, total minus delta s total. These two probabilities, they must be rigorously balanced. And this we see here in the line, if we plot this function, and here we see that is a detailed fluctuation theory, which is much more because each entropy value must be, if you have so many positive, you must have your right, uh, you know right away from the value of the negative entropy, how many you must have with minus four, minus three, minus uh, X uh, value that uh, your negative entropy will have. Yeah? You know the probability right away by the positive one. The positive are, one are much more frequent. These you can measure exactly. And then you can project also very rare events. You can project right away what the extreme negative where negative event will be. And as I showed you, it seems to be that this negative entropy will be the biggest acceleration when you have access to these extreme events in the Lagrangian. This we worked also together uh, with the group. Uh, the citation is over, shown over there with your French colleagues. Okay. I come to last application to show that it's not only sticked to turbulence, you can go also to wave data. In the wave, you have the heights of the, of the wave. And a typical feature, what one has to explain are these rock waves or monster waves. Here we have a measurement from Chapman where we saw uh, one monster wave was measured. But at this point, you can look as for the experimental data of turbulence, you can look at the joint multipoint statistics just and apply this procedure, determining the Fokker Planck equation, determining the entropy, and everything like this. And here you see also, if you apply it, you see that these monster waves are negative entropy events and that the integral fluctuation theory is quite well fulfilled. And furthermore, we can derive a forecasting of it. I will jump back to this one. And we can make a lot of simulations. And this goes a little bit in the large deviation theory. If we have the Fokker Planck equation, we can generate synthetic data. And now for the model, actual model understanding of monsters waves, we believe these are described by the nonlinear Schrödinger equation and they're expected different rock waves. There is one peak and there is three peaks, three sister peak and so on. And the amazing point is if we do our stochastic analysis, take our Fokker-Planck equation and from the Fokker-Planck equation, determine rare extreme events. This is shown here. We determined it several times. It is a stati statistical equation. And then we see this normal rock wave and the three sister. We get even a result which we have not measured because it has a probability 10 to minus 10. Or we, therefore, we have not sufficient data. We never measured it. But from the stochastic processes, if we model it, we get this structure. We could also do this wave data analysis, we take the data and from the data, we estimate the Fokker-Planck equation. We can take out this event of a rock wave and determine the Fokker-Planck equation, use this Fokker-Planck equation, generate with this Fokker-Planck equation new data, and then we find again these rock waves. And we learned this for data from the Japanese Sea, and we did the same from data from the North Sea. The North Sea had different wind condition, different local condition, the waves were different. And we did it and we saw in the, in the North Sea, we do not expect a rock wave. We do not expect such a negative entropy value because entropy statistics was under, uh, was different. Whereas the Japanese Fokker-Planck equation showed us that there should be rock waves. So here you, you see, I come to the point. 
I have on one side, and for for the uh, rock waves, it is not the uh, Navier-Stokes equation; it's a nonlinear Schrödinger equation. On one side, I have the equation. I have some approximation with once. I I know some well-known structures, and on the other side, from our experimental approach, statistical approach, which is now perhaps here, I could change the graph because our statistical approach is not based on the Navier-Stokes equation. It is based on measurements, on empirical data. From this, I get this description and I get hand on a multipoint statistics with entropies. And then the entropy concept will tell us whether there are structures, this big acceleration, this monster wave. For, for, for turbulence, we have only a big increment, but there we are working what other structures we can see, turbulent structures of our data. And this was uh, at the beginning what I said a bit, these two approaches, statistical approach and, 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 and numerical approach, that they are perhaps just two sides of one coin. There was uh, this work of Jan Friedrich who tried to derive from the Navier-Stokes equation over the Lundgren equation, the Fokker-Planck equation. He somehow succeeded for the Euler equation, but not for the Navier-Stokes equation. As I saw, it's horrible, difficult, these calculations. But this would be a little bit the vision that perhaps also from the Fokker-Planck equation, you can project in a simplified simplified way, way out this Fokker-Planck equation. And this is just a stochastic description, what we also achieve by other simulations like large eddy simulations. And the both come together, we get the statistics and the structures because we have multipoint statistics, joint multipoint statistics. This is the key issue. If we have the right, joint multipoint statistics, we should see also the structure. And the nice philosophical, very important uh, result is that these structures are not something independent from the turbulent small scale noise, the normal noise. Over the fluctuation theorem, the positive entropy events, which are the typical noise, and the negative entropy events, which are the structures, are in a rigorous balance. And this is telling us this as a consequence of the fluctuation theory, integral fluctuation theory, which in my opinion is really well fulfilled. And well, I hope this will give some new insights into turbulence. And I hope you liked uh, this presentation. Okay, I'm at the end of my talk. So thank you, Joachim, for uh, for the very interesting talk. So uh, uh, I would say then let's open the uh, stage for for questions. So if you agree, whoever. Yes. Good. Cool. Yes. So I see Alan uh, Kerstin who, who would like to ask a question. So Alan, go ahead, and then Jim. Thank you. To me, this feels like uh, I've just seen a Copernican revolution, at least in my picture of turbulence. And so I'm trying to relate what survives pre-Copernican, having heard uh, your talk. Uh, in, in terms of uh, intermittency, people talk about the cascade bypass. And then you know we have this business of the saturation of the structure functions. And is that caused by events originating at the integral scale? Mm -hmm. It sounds to me like the, it's uh, the locality of the cascade that is the, is that the originator of the ability to write the Fokker-Planck equation and the, at least to the entropy theorem and everything. So it's, the, it's like the, the opposite. So it's like the world turned upside down. So, uh, and, and also the locality of the cascade, of course, is a, has always been accepted as a, a reasonable leading order phenomenological idea, but for the rogue waves to also obey this, 
suggests that there's some cascade locality in that process, but where's the phenomenology for that? I could go on, but I think I've thrown enough out there for you to chew on for a minute. Uh, you're right, yeah, it is a locality. Uh, or we get out some local events out of the statistics, and, and this is very important. And finally, these extreme, extreme events like this rock wave to understand, yeah, you have this cascade, and you, you to get in an extreme way, you have one step yeah, from one increment to the next one. So you have the first points, and then the next one, and the next one. And this one step, and this we in this way we calculate the extreme, the large deviation, the very rare events, we take here a probability of 10 to minus 100. But increments, this I can estimate quite well. And then in the next step, I take also a rare event, 10 to minus 100, and 10 to minus 100, and 10 to minus 100. And this way, I can go down the cascade, I can show you the cascade with a probability of 10 to minus 10, and find which structure it has. And these are the rare events, and then we are in the wings of it. But there is another issue, what you say, and I must be honest, there is one point I do not understand in the whole framework, what you say in the locality. If I have one set of increments and I take the next one, I shift them only. So one cascade somehow has some information on the other one. And this is something, and I think there we do also something. And there, this I do not, there I have not, not a good understanding. What is, there I must, have, I'm not at the end of my thinking. But I think there is also something where you clearly see that there is something locality, what you not, uh, call locality, there's something going on. And this information of one cascade to the next step, how the one cascade is transferred over to the next one, I think that I still have to work. But I, I guess that this is also somehow showing you afterwards how these, these, these structures are, are locally generated. Is there a dependence on self? I, I didn't catch a, a, a anywhere invoking the self similarity. To, that I can show you in the Fogger Planck equation for self similar solution. It can give you for all these cascade models, Schelebeck and so on, the Fogger Planck equation. Okay. Now, you what about the, the symmetry in the Fogger Planck equation? I wrote already minus r dr, so it, they must scale dr. And if, if d1 and d2, I can make, if I have the Fogger Planck equation, I have an analytic solution for the structure function. Okay. I have differential equation in r for the structure function. And I can show that the structure function we can reproduce very well. And I can show exactly which term will cause uh, scaling behavior. But the essential part in the middency and, and what we found here, this instant tone, this, this extreme event forbidden zone that you don't can, that you get a non-trivial solution. Therefore, you need also a, a violating, a, a, a scaling violating term. But this we have shown in the, for, uh, in the, uh, uh, in the physical review letter of last year. But you can, the whole, structure function, self-similarity, and so on. This is consistent. You can write down the solution, which Fokker-Planck equation you need to have it. So is, is the uh, structure, is the sa saturation of the structure function exponents, which has been shown in most okay. recent years, is, is that a necessary uh, consequence of your theory? No, 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 no. We did a bit in this one work where I showed you where we had this, uh, this 60 different sets. And there you see how everything is evolving with the Reynolds number and whether there is a saturation, yes or not. But yeah, because the saturation, you mean this one with higher, higher Reynolds numbers, yeah? Well, I mean, as you go to higher and higher orders, in other words, structure function is, uh, u, u of x minus u of x plus r to the power n. Yes. And then you take the whole thing, average it, take it one over n, and then, then the structure function scaling is r to the minus an exponent indexed by n. But for a large n, the saturation means all those exponents become the same value for a large n. Okay, whether it's saturating or not. Okay. Uh, 
I did not look into this one and where it might be that you need to insert some uh, some jump noise. The, you must. I work with with Brownian motion, yeah, a white noise. There you may see that this is also a result for the Burgess equation from Jan Friedrich that he shows that there you need uh, uh, a different stochastic process. And he claims that D4 and D4, five plays then a role to get this to this point. For me, with the data of 10 to 10 data, I see no need to go into this situation. Because from the 10th moment, or you expect after the 10th, 12th moment that the saturation will take place, but to statistically correctly determine the 12th moment, I can show how many data you need and this data nobody will measure. Okay, but the exact theory, theory doesn't come. Pardon? But the exact theory doesn't uh, compel the saturation. Because uh, when you talk about instant time, it sounds like, you know, you're looking at, most extreme events, you think, you know. Yeah, okay, but this is definitely, if I go in the most extreme event, I come to this point and to be realistic, I must get consistent with this, what you're saying. You're right, uh, where I did not work through. There can be something done further. In principle, you can achieve it with this hooker planck equation. You can say how good you come and where you end. There's no problem to make some, some result. But for me, for in, in, in all these analysis, the integral fluctuation theorem will only work with all my data if I have a scaling violating contribution. So I do not have a proper scaling. It is close to scaling, but I get a deviation. If I take a Fokker-Planck equation, which fulfills, I can fit everything, optimize everything with a Fokker-Planck equation, which has self-similar structure only, the integral fluctuation theory is not fulfilled. We are kicked out. So my okay. claim, that's why I'm not so much interested in the higher order moments, because I think, I, in my opinion, experimentally, the higher order moments are artifacts because I can't measure them correctly. So there seem to be a very, and, and this is definitely, at this point, uh, the theory quite often, many people say, forget it, they don't like it, because I am main, the main result is there's a very, very important non-scaling contribution in this cascade. And this makes more pronounced intermittency, contributes important to the intermittency. And I think it is more important than the, tenth, the correction of the tense order structure function. But this is a provocative answer. I know I get a lot of that from my head. Okay, so that means it's not all quite settled yet, which makes it that much more interesting. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, definitely one. I, I take it open. Yeah, yeah, you can. This is something one has discussed. Okay, thank you. So uh, I see Jim who would like to ask a question. Yeah, I think that was great. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this discussion. We, we've talked so much and I only understand a certain fraction of what you're telling me. And this kind of helped it organize uh, quite a lot for me. And which makes me really disappointed that we're not going to see each other this summer at, in, in Lille, that we can't seem to be there at the same time so we could talk one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but at any rate, uh, th thank you very much for organizing all of this. So I, I you know, I, I'd, I'd like to ask more questions that are in interpretation, really about interpretation. So I, I guess I have sort of two lines of questions that are interrelated. The first is, I'm, I'm you know, I, I'm not uh, an expert on uh, many of these theoretical uh, um, developments that you describe in your own work. Um, with the Fokker-Planck equation based on Markov processes and statistical theory and all of the rest. <clears throat> so I'm kind of a little bit confused about a fundamental point. You start off, of course, making a, a very uh, good uh, discussion about distinction between statistical approaches and more local approaches to focus on coherent structure, et cetera. Uh, and I guess I tend to be more on the physical structure side uh, of my work. Um, and I'm trying to understand, yeah, you, you, you show these movies at the end and you talk about trajectories through the cascade process 
um, the, the trajectory picture and the cascade process and Fokker Planck and all the rest of it, these are statistical um, based um, developments. And yet when you showed the movie, they're not, they're not statistical, they're, they're local. So I don't understand how you go from the statistical description and you talk about positive and negative entropy events to the local description that you show. If you can go back to your movie that you showed at the beginning where you had, uh, I think, yeah, that movie right there. On the right side, I mean, it looks like you're showing local events which are non-statistical and yet the theory is all about statistical. So can you explain how you do that? Yeah. For each local velocity change, local fluctuation, yeah, which is interesting. If you have one velocity as the same, laminar flow, we know everything. Yeah, this is all. So it's always interesting how the, the velocity is changing locally. Yeah? And for all local velocity change, my claim is this is a consequent of an endpoint. It's embedded in many more points. Yeah, the local Flow structure, what you see to the left, is in my algorithm a consequence of multipoint statistics. I need the whole cascade which ends up there. And I take the next local, and this again has its own cascade. And by this, so I get for what are you actually plotting? What are you actually plotting in, in, in each of these frames? What are the colors? Left represent? is the velocity magnitude. Yeah, you have uh, in the middle a jet. This okay, okay, got it. Okay. Is it is the total velocity or is it outside. the fluctuating or the total? Pardon? So the so the left is the total velocity, instantaneous total. velocity. Yeah. Instantaneous okay. Velocity. Yeah. okay. Okay, and, and the right and to the y is always for the local velocity change, their entropy. So it's one term in an ensemble average. It's one. It's one realization of an ensemble average. Yeah, it is. It each each frame you have locally here and here and here a velocity difference between two pixels, and for this velocity difference with the surrounding with the endpoint embedded in the endpoint, I can determine a, for this local event an entropy. Yeah, and here the theory I is for the negative yeah. entropy events. What you see is all the negative entropy events, what is finally saying, because we see the negative entropy is correlated to big changes, it is the big increments. But there are increments, big increments, which are stochastically not correct, uh, which have positive entropy due to fluctuation. Randomly, you can change everything, but where you have a structure where, where the cascade, where the multi points, the sequence of the point, is forcing that you must have a big fluctuation at small scales, there I get negative entropy. So in the right-hand picture then, you have to choose the scale at which you're drawing these entropy events, don't you? No, I take always the integral length scale down to the Taylor length scale. These include the entire range of scales in, in that trajectory for, picture? For that the you entire show. range, I, I determine. And this, if you take the construction, this means I take a piece of your data for the smallest increments, which have the integral length scale. I take all these data and all the statistical of this whole data will give you locally an entropy. Okay, all right. All right, so that, that's a good segue into the next question that I want to ask is the interpretation of entropy. So, uh, you know, I, in, in context with second law of thermodynamics, I understand uh, a certain amount about entropy and how to interpret it and so on. I, I've taught thermodynamics and so on. But in context with the Fokker Planck equation, the definition of entropy, um, how, how do we think of it? I mean, I mean, you, you think of in thermodynamics, you think of it as related to heat transfer, um, you know, into and out of systems and so on. And you talk about its implications on the creation of disorder, entropy increasing versus um, uh, order, entropy um, decreasing and so on. So here, negative entropy events are, I guess, are events where 
Okay, is it appropriate to think of these as more organized uh, events, whereas the positive entropy events, as you describe, are the more the random events, the less organized, less coherent type of events? Is that the right interpretation of this definition of entropy? Yeah, this is a statistical interpretation in this direction. You're correct. Okay, Wait, then in, if we go back to that movie again, uh, I'm, I was... See, you see, you see as the Fogger-Planck e equation is describing the cascade, yeah, is describing the cascade, yeah, statistically, negative entropy will be if you are somehow thermodynamical out of equilibrium. The farer away you are from the mean solution of the Fogger-Planck equation, mm. the more you get negative entropies. So, okay, so negative entropy is associated with out of equilibrium, but is it also associated with more local organization and structures? And the reason I'm asking is because the pictures you're drawing, they don't look, I was expecting to see well-organized structures at the small scales and they don't look that way visually. Okay. But this is, this is just the point where we start working. This is a, a first experiment, we have new experiments where we work out. I hope with the entropy, I, I know with the entropy, I get the increment structures, yeah? The nice biggest increment, but definitely is an increment the structure of turbulence. We want to relate this entropy with the vorticity and other quantity and see whether they are correlated or not. Oh, I see, okay. If, find, if I see the negative entropy event are uh, with the entropy or vorticity maxima, where if yeah. I find this relation, yeah, yeah, then it would be fantastic because then I can say additional with the statistics. Yeah, well, that, I guess that's what I had in my head, and and, yeah. and 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 that was the reason for my questions. Is it doesn't look that way, um, and yet you say that it's uh, the negative entropy events are pointing to the parts of that dynamical system that are moving out of equilibrium. Uh, so they seem a little bit contradictory, you know, the, the vortex tubes that we picture at the small scales and so on. Um, these are, are, are local structures that, uh, you know, some of them are particular, maybe, maybe it's because you're looking at these are picking out the really extreme events, the ones that are not the typical ones you see when you look at a direct numerical simulation picture and that kind of a thing. So that they're out of equilibrium, they're changing very rapidly and so on, and they're changing their structure, et cetera. Yeah, I'm just trying to get the physical interpretation uh, of, of the statistical analysis uh, based on the Fokker-Planck equation. Okay, for the waves, the rock waves, it worked very nicely. Yeah, and there I got the structures for me. Yeah. But I must agree with you, for the turbulence, the structures is more complicated. You have yeah. for tubes and so on. Yeah. And yeah. there I think we still have, we or we still work yeah. with it. Perhaps yeah. you have also to, to, to look at different increments. I can define it also different. I can take 2D increments, longitudinal yeah. and transversal, but I, I do I, I still have to work to see what is the right quantity I look in this multipoint yeah. picture to really see then the entropy for this and perhaps show relate it, for example, to the tubes or to something like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. This is my dream. This is my dream that I yeah, can yeah, it. Yeah. Well, it, it, seemed, it seemed like with, with the wave problem, you immediately attached these extreme events to rogue waves, yes. which you, you developed immediately a, a physical picture. Uh, now, I don't know if that was just um, sort of your, 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 your own thinking of maybe a, a, of how to interpret these things or if you actually mathematically tied them to rogue waves, uh, but here you don't seem to have the corresponding physical picture. But I, uh, I guess this is something you're working towards. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Great. Well, I really enjoyed it a lot. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. Hi, Joachim. Can I quickly ask him? Hello, Joachim. It's Christos. Hi, hi, Christos. Uh, uh, if I understand well, you said there is a balance between how many events between the uh, negative entropy events and, po and positive entropy events somehow. You said that there's this integral perpetuation theorem which uh, somehow balances them. Yes. Uh, if you understand correctly that if, if a process is, is Markovian, then the integral perpetuation theorem holds. So yes. how it goes? Okay. The answer was yes? Yes, yes. 
Okay. If it okay. So if I take, then if it I take, can mathematically prove, then the integral fluctuation should hold. So if I take a a first order ordinary differential equation, I take a function x of t, and I write dx by dt equals f of x. Yes. That is Markovian. Yes. So how do I then get from this simple ODE, your integral fluctuation theorem, all the various things you said? No, if you have no fluctuation, if you have a deterministic case, then you have entropy zero, and then you get e to minus zero, it's one, and then it's fulfilled rigorously. Then you get a trivial result, yeah? If you have, if you have no fluctuations, if you have a deterministic part, then you would get in this framework that uh, then you are, you are, you are this okay. would be a delta function, yeah? Of zero, okay. and you take e to, to minus zero, and then you get one. So if I have an ordinary differential equation, dx of a dt equals a function of x, which is nonlinear, a tent map or something. Yeah. Then, then what happens? Yeah, yeah, it's good. If you take a chaotic system, you have a three-dimensional Fokker Planck equation. You can write it down. It should hold. I don't know. You are a theoretician, you can calculate it. I would do it on the computer and play numerically with it. Yeah. But so you mean for any function, if I take d by dt of x, dx by dt equals function of x, and the function of x is nonlinear some 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 way, for any such function, I will always have that the exponential of minus entropy averaged is equal to one for any such function. Yes. Yes, but we must. Ah, la, 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 la. This is this is this is mathematic. But but this is basic mathematics. This you should ask Seifert, not me. But anyway, anyway, I'm just thinking around whether you. But uh, you see, if if you have your case, I do not know. In your case, you don't get an instationary, instationary. Uh, Fokker Planck equation. You have a stationary Fokker Planck equation. Yeah. Uh, if you have what? a differential equation, you have a stationary equation. Yeah. Uh huh. And then I think it will hold also, but then everything will be, I guess it will become more or less a trivial solution. But the amazing point here is that this is holds for instationary, that you have a system which is with it changing and in principle and this is a bit a bit here the astonishing part that it works it is phenomenologically on an experimental list i'm happy that it works the interesting part usually you expect that you you have this cascade you're going down but the system has sufficient long time to to thermalize afterwards you have a transition and you come out but here in the cascade, I just see a change to this one, and there's no clear this non this nest non equilibrium stationary state you need. And this is difficult to see whether we have fulfilled it here, and we see only phenomenological all this works. But there we can discuss in a little further. There we have I have okay. more okay. theory. So all right, thank you, Joachim. Thanks, thank you. I see there is another question from uh, from Alan, so go ahead. Thank you for indulging me for another question because this uh, discussion uh, just of the last few moments uh, gets to the heart of something that was that's a, a very strong impression I have here. Um, the slide you have up right now, fulfilled to 10 to the minus three, uh, I think you have good justification for uh, seeing it at least as a, a, a reasonable hypothesis that the conditions for this to be fulfilled are exact uh, statistical properties of the Navier-Stokes equation, meaning that the Fokker-Planck equation, the you know, or the Markovian property, and so on, uh, 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 and the cascade 
is an exact property of the equation. Now, people have made very limited uh, if, uh, uh, progress at exact mathematical analysis of the Navier-Stokes equation, but identifying a highly non-trivial mathematical property of that equation, you know, it's chaotic solutions. Obviously, it's, it's a property of deterministic chaos, and similar to, you know, some real, like the Feigenbaum <laughs> relation or something. So, I mean, this, this prevent, it presents a whole new realm of mathematical challenges to look for exact uh, statistical properties of Navier-Stokes. And, and even to go beyond that, the, uh, the, the discussion with Christos raises the question of what class of nonlinear deterministic uh, PDEs that have chaotic solutions ultimately have these Markovian type cascades as their mathematical properties. It's clearly not limited to Navier-Stokes. I wouldn't say clearly, but I would say there's a hint from your rogue wave analysis that Navier-Stokes is not the unique uh, uh, system. So the ultimate mathematical question is what class of these nonlinear uh, PDEs with uh, chaotic solutions has this uh, a, a set of properties that's sufficient for the um, uh, integral uh, entropy law to um, apply. Anyway, that's just an impression. If you no, want no, to, uh, you're right. You're right. You're right. Elaborate on. You, you're totally right. And, and and you you know, turbulence is not Markovian. Yeah, it is not Markovian. But you must pay attention here. I make this stupid stuff with this multipoint, and then I ga go in this increment space. Yeah, I do not look Markovian property evolving in time. But evolving in a difference, in a difference, in a difference, in a difference, in a difference. So I make some transformation of space. I do not look normally what you are looking at. And if you have a dynamical system, Markovian is a, if I am now, I look what happens next. And this can be Markovian or not. And this is for turbulence, definitely not the case. But I look, I take here an increment and look with the next, it is somehow in time, but I take an interval and there I look for the Markovian. And 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 I'm sure. Uh, okay, I do this phenomenologically. Where I got, I have these Markov processes in R in scale. I got a lot of criticism very often about this, but it's okay. I think it it works. But I I I have the feeling that I do somehow a transformation of a complex system, Navier-Stokes equation, nonlinear Schrödinger equation, which evolves in time, in another space, in the increment space, and in here. I can describe it simpler. And here, I'll, with a sudden, I see a Markov property. And can, I think can, I do that right. mathematically. I'm not, I think there, it is, uh, there is a lot what, what I do. I do not know mathematically the full consequence, but it might be interested that there is perhaps a class that you describe a, Fokker, a, a stochastic nonlinear differential, partial differential equation in X in real space. And there's an equivalent formulation in increment space with a stochastic Markov process. Well, importantly, it's not a stochastic differential equation. It's a deterministic differential equation that has chaotic solutions. So you're establishing a statistical property of chaos. That's why I compared yes, it to, yes, yes, to yes. Feigenbaum. Okay, you're right. And this might be, I do not know where the stochastic is coming from. It might be because I take one dimensional cut yeah, I'm not. And also, you're ensemble averaging. I mean, you're not. This isn't a property of in, the the integral th fluctuation theorem doesn't apply instantaneously. It applies to an ensemble. So, mm -hmm. so you, you're looking at an ensemble of chaotic solutions and finding a, 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 a plausibly exact statistical property. I mean, it's mathematically, it's highly, highly non-trivial. And I, I don't even know. Why. I believe I do not know what nonsense I'm doing, but I see I could work. I didn't show it here. I can generate new data sets that can make short time forecasts and so on. I have access to the multi point statistics. And up to now, I didn't see any contradiction to my data. Yeah. I can explain really everything, yeah, what I see in the data. Yeah. 
there's nothing controversial about data unless there was a bug in your data reduction code. I don't see how there's any controversy. Here's a, here's a fact you've identified. The, the, there's not even a controversy about its interpretation because nobody has an opinion. It's just, it, it, nobody has a theory right now. Yeah. It's just the unknown. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I saw before uh, Jim wants to, to ask a question. So Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to join the conversation between Joachim and, and Alan. Um, my interpretation of the um, ultimate application of Fokker-Planck is the um, model assumption that the small scales in high Reynolds number turbulence is behaving close enough to the Markovian process that you can describe um, the statistics, as Alan pointed out, with um, uh, with the Fokker-Planck equation. Is that is that? It, I thought of it as a model, uh, and then but then you blatantly said turbulence is not Markovian, and of course what that means is there's deviations from Markovian, and of course that's true with any model of turbulence or any model of anything really. You can always find deviations. So is my interpretation correct that this is not directly tied? Your 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 approach is not directly tied to the Navier-Stokes equation, it's, it's a model, uh, a statistical model of uh, observation, which obviously comes from the Navier-Stokes equation, but it's not directly tied to the Navier-Stokes equation. Is that the correct interpretation? This is, from my point of view, perfectly correct. There okay. is a little bit more you can add. This is the work of Jan Friedrich. He did with the Lundgren equation and so on. This formalism, he derived it from the Burgess equation, which is a cooked down Navier-Stokes equation, and where he could show in which sense you can project out such a Fokker-Planck equation from this determinist from this equation. But right. it is, but it is, uh, but for me at the moment, what you said, I could sign. It is a phenomenological observation. I take the data, I do it, and it works. How it is right. related to the Navier-Stokes equation, I do not. I do not know even where the noise is coming in. Yeah, I yeah, 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 yeah. And this okay. is you know, definitely a tough question. It must be. Yeah. And I, we have done also numerical data analysis. This was uh, uh, two-dimensional turbulence and other numerical data with Oliver Kamps from Münster, and it works there also. I can take DNS data and analyze, and I see similar results. Yeah. Okay. All right, thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, ju just uh, just one one question about the the interpretation about uh, of the of this uh, conservation property. So basically, this somehow calls for a. Um, a sort of uh, new definition of what an equilibrium state is, because basically, uh, if this uh, transformation somehow always preserves the equilibrium uh, uh, of the of the entropies in the sense that you kind of um, balance uh, positive and negative entropies, basically you can redefine. The, the principle of the equilibrium in the system of statistics, the way you, you gather the statistics and always say, no matter where the, the, what kind of turbulence we have, it's always in equilibrium with respect to these definitions that correct, correct. You can see it in this way, but you can see it also as Christoph said before, this entropy, if the approach, what I do with Fokker-Planck, the modeling mm -hmm. for Fokker-Planck, is correct, yeah. And it should be a trivial result. It is only a consistency check. Yes, yes, sure, yeah? sure, sure, sure. Consistency. But but the interesting point is at this moment, and this we discussed, and this I think is the future. I should work if behind this entropy there is a physical meaning. Yeah, yeah sure, sure. This is something else which is not proven. I do not know. I was surprised that I see something like a structure, yeah, like the acceleration and so on. I see it. And this excites me because then the entropy with this, they get a meaning for, for turbulence. So far, it is only a consistency check that, that I do, that it works. 
Yeah, sure, sure. Whatever, whatever. If, if, uh, either it's an entropy in the way we intended for for uh, thermodynamics, or it's an entropy in the way intended for for a dynamical system like uh, disturbance from from an equilibrium state. At the end of the day, it's yeah. it's actually an integral property. It's an invariant of uh, an integral invariant. So, uh, if uh, if that gets confirmed for other kinds of flows, well, uh, that's uh, that's a great. Uh, uh, property actually <laughs> uh, that can potentially eventually even uh, uh, open new new insights for modeling turbulence because uh, turbulence modeling events eventually should should preserve this property yes yes that's 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 also something which has uh, practical implication in uh, in uh, in modeling and uh, mm -hmm. uh, understanding that's uh, predicting as well uh, okay so Thank you very much, Joachim, for uh, for the very interesting talk. I, as you can, as you could see, the the discussion was very active and uh, very lively. <laughs> so that's. Uh, I I think we we shortly discussed about this at the beginning before the presentation. It went quite uh, quite well because via discussions we kind of uh, understood better the 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 point of the presentation and enter a little bit more in details about that thanks again thanks for for uh, uh, replying to so many questions and uh, for the presentation also, to you and to all who post question very nice to hear you and partially see you <laughs> it is nice okay <laughs> okay so i invite all the audience to thank our speaker again and hope to see you soon next week okay Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.